wonderful to connect um, in, in this way that we can. It wouldn't have been possible in the past. Being, you know, 300 years old myself uh, is just something that I can't even uh, believe that we're doing. So it's great to connect with you, um, to go over and get you excited and activated about conscious dreaming, um, and particularly lucid dreaming. So lucid dreaming is, if you, if you know by definition, it's a style of dream where you wake up within the dream and you become completely uh, conscious and aware of your environment as much as you are right now just listening to me talk. Uh, so really interesting things can happen in the lucid dream state uh, because it we are focused and aware and we're engaging with the dream itself. So there's ways in which you can learn from your dreams within this conscious state. There's ways in which you can um, heal and transcend any trauma within your life uh, in this style of dream. Also, it's a chance to go a bit deeper. If you feel like you're a spiritual person, you can connect in spiritual ways. You can also expand your uh, awareness and your consciousness about yourself and your path and your connection within uh, this universe. And you can also use lucid dreams as just a form of um, entertainment. Some people just like to have, um, you know, be entertained while they're sleeping. So lucid dreaming can definitely bring about a good dose of entertainment for those of you who feel like you, you'd like to be entertained uh, uh, within your dream state. And also some people use it also for cre creative practice. So if you're um, a musician or an artist or you, you love writing writing or poetry or books, anything at all really, you can use uh, the use lucid dream states as well to uh, inspire your creative practice. And you can take a lot of your experiences through the dream state and bridge it over into your waking reality and uh, make some wonderful and beautiful things to share with the world. So no matter where you're at with um, your life and your path and, and what you want fulfilled in your life, you can use lucid dreaming in any type of way that, that fits nicely within uh, your your framework as, as a person. So the cool thing too about lucid dreaming is that you don't need to subscribe to any uh, school of thought, any um, uh, religion or any um, ideology. Uh, lucid dreamers from all around the world follow all different types of uh, thought or belief systems. So you have people who are not spiritual at all, like completely um, atheist or agnostic. They're still exploring lucid dreaming. Um, and you have people who are Christians or people who are Buddhist or uh, people who are just like naturists, all exploring um, lucid dreaming within their own framework. So it doesn't ma matter where you're at. You can bring in whatever is um, resonates with you and whatever your uh, beliefs are can get pulled into your dreaming experiences as well. So that's the beauty with it. Uh, this is a, a, a connection with you. Um, it's a connection with your consciousness and your experience uh, through the dream state. So everything that is just integrally you will come through in, in the ways that it makes sense. So I know with lucid dreaming, being coming conscious and aware in the dream state, some people who follow uh, a spiritual path might have their, um, their spiritual um, uh, guide or uh, God come through in, in the lucid dream state. And that, that is a really profound experience. For example, you know, if you're a Christian, you might have um, uh, experiences with uh, angels or with Christ or, you know, that's just an example. Or if you um, are Buddhist, you might have something that's within the Buddhist framework come through. And certainly, even if you don't have any religious um, following, you might have some other profound experience that helps you feel uh, transformed in some kind of way. So I always like to articulate that with, uh, with lucid dreaming that this is um, connecting with your inner worlds and your, it's activating your inner worlds and your dream worlds and whatever is within your 
uh, belief system will come through with that as well. So you can certainly work with that. And you see it in all types of faiths and all types of beliefs as well, that dreams held a very important um, presence to them. So from every major world religion, certainly there are um, the scriptures of, um, you know, the, the, the Holy Bible or even the Quran or even Buddhist, uh, ancient Buddhist texts, there is always talk about dreams. There's always talk about dream work or visions or things happening in the dream realm. So this is something that's a, uh, a thread that links through a lot of um, the various world faiths and it's intrinsically a human thing. So it's something that we've been doing since the dawn of time. All of us human beings have been dreaming and we've been um, listening to our dreams. And possibly at one point in, in um, our, our timeline of human history, we might have taken our dreams a little bit more seriously in the past. Um, you can see many examples of this uh, through ancient texts that people did seem to take dreams seriously. So kings would consult seers uh, when they had, had a dream that felt um, that it was very important, so their dreams would get interpreted, and you see countless examples of this happening through various um, uh, cultures throughout history. Even shamans, uh, you know, tribe members would uh, consult shamans for, for their dream interpretation. And so we've got this, you know, this healthy sort of history of taking our dreams seriously, and we wanted to know, we want to know what they mean. Um, and then it seems at one point throughout history, we, we kind of fell away from our relationship with dreams and we began to start see, seeing them as just, you know, residues of, of, of what we might have seen during the day or junk data or just frivolous, surreal little imaginations that we experience as we sleep. But whatever it is, it feels as though uh, dreams hold a profound mystery for all of us. Um, we can all probably remember at least a couple of dreams that have really affected us in our lives, either in a positive way or a not so positive way. It could have been a nightmare. And so we, we all have these personal experiences with dreams where you're like, I'll never forget that dream or I'll never forget that nightmare. So that, that just, there's something in that, that we all have these shared experiences and that we have collectively been touched in some kind of way through these visions that we have as we sleep. So no matter what it is and the reasons why we've fallen away from the importance of dreams, a big part of um, my work is to help activate people and then excite them to reconnect once more, to reconnect to their inner worlds and to not just reconnect, but go deep and explore and to and push the envelope and to expand and that there is uh, lots of scope for that. There's a lot of scope for expansion in the dream state. Now there's not, um, uh, even though, you know, we've all been dreaming, for thousands of years as human beings, uh, it's only been really recently that dreams have been looked at and studied in like sleep lab uh, environments. And really only recently uh, in the late 70s where there were lucid dreaming was actually uh, quote unquote discovered, it was documented in the sleep lab. Where, but we have been doing this for thousands and thousands of years as human beings. Uh, so it just goes to show that, you know, um, we had a lot to catch up on really, like when it comes to uh, consciousness exploration and, and dreams and coming together with science. So only really since the late 70s that we've had, you know, the scientific proof. So to me, that's really exciting because it makes, it, it makes you realize that there's more to discover. And I think that when we sleep at night, our consciousness is in still some way connected and that we can um, finally tune it and, and train ourselves in which to 
become more fully aware while we're asleep. So this is the, the path of the conscious dreamer. And this all starts off um, in, in very small ways, which I'll go through this evening to, to get you inspired to start a little practice for yourself so that it really builds up to the point where you are becoming a regular lucid dreamer and you start really exploring things through your dreams. Now, I always um, guide people through the conscious dreaming practice to, to let them know that all the dreams are equally as important. So I know like having the lucid dream is, is really, wow, it's a, a pinnacle moment. And, and it often can be so transformative that people wake up from a lucid dream and they just think, I, this questioning, this is making me question the nature of reality. It really like throws your reality checks in the spin because it's that's so visceral and so more real than th this reality that we're in. But because we're always striving for the pinnacle, we sometimes don't look at all the other just seemingly normal dreams and maybe not take them on board as being important. Whereas they are. So a big part of what I teach with the conscious dreaming practice is that all the dreams that you have are of importance, that they are all a map work and a blueprint of your unconscious mind. And they're all part of a puzzle too. So they're really, uh, it's important to take them all on board and it's important to document them. So we'll go over one of the first things uh, as the foundation of a conscious dreamer and preparing you to become a lucid dreamer. The most important thing to do is start uh, a discipline of recording your dreams. So some of you might already be doing that and that could be in the, in the form of a dream journal or um, you know, typing out your dreams and keeping a file on your, on your laptop. Um, other ways in which you can record your dreams are uh, simply a dictaphone app on your phone, uh, doing it the old fashioned way if you want a tape recorder or like an old fashioned dictaphone, uh, could be another way. Uh, you can get creative with however you want to record your dreams. Uh, some people do it just on their phone and a little notepad. But it's We're important oh getting your feet. Um, recording your dreams as it creates a record so that's important and I'll tell you why that's important in a bit. It also helps you uh, improve your dream memory recall so the more you're writing down your dreams uh, the more you remember them. It's like you're, you're training this part of your brain uh, the memory recall to to bring in more memory of more dreams and it also seems to trigger more dreams the more you write them down it, it, you just kickstart something. So you're like, yes, okay, uh, I'm grabbing these dreams. I'm grabbing them as soon as I wake up and I'm getting them out and getting them recorded. And there's something really important about that when it comes to this feedback loop of um, recall and memory and triggering more dreams and just getting into the gist of uh, dreaming, recording, and then more dreaming. And it just becomes a really nice morning ritual that you'll find that you start to really enjoy. And it becomes um, almost mindful too, because you're touching in with yourself, you know, and, and you're reflecting. And this is an important part of your, your practice as well, is, is doing this interconnection with yourself, touching in with yourself. So the dream journaling is, um, can't stress it enough how important it is. It's also really important because you start to see patterns and you start to see threads that start linking in um, between dreams. So it can be possibly themes that keep coming up. You're like, wow, I keep having like a chase dream um, constantly. So, you know, these are big messages when they come up in recurring themes, it's a chance to look at that and say, well, Am I stressing out? Oh, I must be stressed in my waking moments. I think it's linked to this. So that's great. Your dreams are helping you um, to take care of yourself effectively in your waking time. So your dreams can give you messages through recurring themes, 
which help you reflect on your behavior and your waking time and to adjust things in your life and to take care of yourself. Um, and also you might start seeing like symbols that start to repeat and recur. So you might realize like, wow, I keep having a dream about a bear. It, I've had like six dreams about a bear in six months. So things like that become really important. And that can be important from a personal point of view because you might look at that symbol and look into the symbol of a bear, for example, and see it as a, you know, as a little bit, a little form of guidance through the symbology of the bear or the characteristics and the traits that, that come alongside a bear. And that can, that can really pull in a lot of guidance for you as well when you start to decode and unpack your own dreams. And also recurring symbols get really helpful too when you start doing your lucid dreaming techniques, which we'll go into today in this webinar, um, where you start focusing in on those symbols, those recurring symbols that come up in your dream journal, and you start using the, them as dream triggers and dream signs. So for example, if it is a bear that is a recurring symbol in your dreams, you can set intentions before you go to sleep at night. Um, I'm going to see the bear. I'm going to meet the bear again. And when I see the bear, I'm going to go lucid. I'm going to become aware in the dream. So you can start using the repetitive dream symbols as a trigger alongside your affirmations before you go to sleep. And, you know, before you know it, you'll be having a dream and there's that bear that comes out of the woods and you'll you'll remember it and it will trigger you within the dream state to become awake um, and then it's a really great chance to ask the bear what it symbolizes so you can actually have a conversation with it and say hey you keep showing up what do you want <laughs> you'll be really surprised sometimes what you that the the messages you get from some of your dream characters or your dream symbols so that's another cool aspect of lucid dreaming is that you start um, you, you, you start interacting with the, the, the characters and the symbols that come through in your dream state. So you're actually consciously doing some interesting dialogue and getting so many answers um, from your dream symbols and dream characters. So that's one way in which you can um, help activate um, and prime yourself for lucid dreaming. And that all comes through the record keeping of writing down your dreams. So looking for these repeat symbols and go, hey, it's that, it's a bear, or it could be something else. Um, and it's important too, when you have a, a dream journal, not only does it give you the, these little prompts that you can create dream, dream symbols and dream signs to go lucid in the dream state, but they can hold a deeper meaning for you in the sense where you can pull through some of these symbols into your waking life. So, you know, we talked about pulling them through in the dream state and uh, hopefully activating to become lucid. Well, you can pull them through in your waking life. So for example, if it's the bear, um, try getting yourself, um, you can get yourself like a, an object that's a bear, maybe it's a little sculpture or something. And, and just pulling that symbol into your waking life can help a lot too with, um, with your lucid dreaming. So say you have a little statue of a bear and it's, you just prop it next to your bed. And so before you go to sleep at night, you have a look at it and you go, hey, dream symbol, you keep appearing to me in dreams. I'm looking at you right now. I'm gonna find you in my dreams tonight. So that can help a lot too. And it's called dream bridging. So you, you bridge over the content of your dreams into your waking life and then you're able to uh, cognitively work with the, the, sim the symbology like physically because it's right next to your bed. Uh, so that's another way in which you can really train that muscle uh, um, for lucid dreaming. But it's also really nice too because some people feel that these symbols are quite personal as well. So you can um, start developing your own personal mythology um, in a way where, where you bridge some of these symbols over and they hold like a deeper kind of personal meaning or perhaps spiritual meaning. So it could be the bear, maybe it represents protection for you or strength or courage. And that becomes almost like a symbol 
a, a mythological personal symbol for you. So some people like to bridge it over in that way because it, it gives almost like sense and meaning into their life or along their path and creative depth as well. Um, and if you're obviously, if you're a creative person, this can bridge through in your practice. Uh, you might end up making lots of paintings of bears or, um, you know, writing a story about a bear, whatever it is, you can bridge through the content into your creative practice too. So you can really go a long way. And this is all coming through the act of recording your dreams. So there's so much scope when you're recording your dreams. Um, so that's just an example of using um, symbolic dream symbol, dream symbols and using them for lucid dreaming triggers, but also um, developing things in your, your waking time, personal mythology and creative practice. So dream journal is really important for this. Also, it keeps a record as well of just any um, profound experiences that you might have. Um, some uh, sometimes during your, your, your journey as a conscious dreamer can pull you into other styles of dreams. So you might end up um, experiencing precognitive dreams. Like the more conscious and aware you become as a conscious dreamer, you start getting into really interesting zones. So a precognitive dream is a style of dream in which you dream of an event and then it happens in real life at a later date. So it's almost as though your dream predicted a, the, the outcome of a certain event in waking time. And this goes back from Nostradamus to loads of prophets from the Bible. You know, a lot of people have experienced this style of dream, precognitive dreaming. So it's important to um, keep a record of your dreams because if you have the predisposition for precognition, and precognitive dreaming, then you have a record of it. You can say, look, I did have the dream about the train crash. And, you know, so then you don't feel so, you know, feel, feel so crazy. You actually are able to just go, you know, say, I had this dream. And um, there's something to it. So it's encouraging. It's encouraging as well um, to write your dreams down, especially if you have the precognitive dreaming. It helps uh, give you a little bit more confidence moving forward with your gift. Um, so precognitive dreams too can also end up happening in the lucid dreaming state as well. So you find yourself having a dream and you're very conscious aware within the dream state and it's of a certain scenario. And then that scenario happens later on in your waking life. So these, you know, all of these things can kind of meld into each other, but they're all part of the same practice and it's the practice of conscious dreaming. So yes, writing your dreams down, I would, I would encourage you all, if you haven't started, uh, start tonight. And you can start by just simply writing a dream that you do remember. And it could be a dream that uh, holds some sort of importance to you. That's a really great way to kickstart your dream journal is, is get those really important dreams that you've had from the past written down in, into your journal. It's a really nice starting point. So after this webinar gets started on those dream journals, it's a really um, effective way. Even one month worth of journaling, you're going to see a massive, dis massive difference in your dream, in your dream life. Um, you might even notice it after one week. It is that effective um, and it really gets you activated. So there we have it with the dream journaling. Another really important aspect of um, conscious dreaming practice, and particularly when you're wanting to um, move into lucid dreaming, is to um, engage in several acts, uh, uh, mindful acts during the day in order to train your cognitive mind to become more awake and aware in the dream state. And with this comes this technique called reality checks. And I know a lot of you probably already heard this buzzword. Some of you, it might be a completely new um, term phrase for you. So a reality check is basically a habitual habit that you will do several times a day, which makes you question the nature of reality. 
And it's important to do this because of a few things. One, it gets your cognitive uh, feedback loop going. Um, is this reality? Is this a dream? And that's really important because you'll find that you'll end up doing that in the dream state. And it also helps to pull your present awareness right into the present moment and becoming really like, really present and really in the moment and really in the now. And that's a really important thing when we become lucid dreamers because we want to be fully present within the dream state. So we train ourselves to be fully present many times during the day. And I think a really good way of starting off this practice is basically doing a reality check every time, uh, every time you go to the bathroom and you're in the bathroom and you're ready to leave and you're washing your hands and we're all doing the COVID hand washing like so much right now. So maybe you could even do more reality checks. But look in the mirror. Everyone has a mirror in the bathroom. Let this be your form of reality checking. So you're looking at your reflection in the mirror and you just really hold yourself in the present moment and really look at your reflection. And as you really study your face, look into your own eyes and study all the little lines on your face and everything to do with your visual appearance, you begin this dialogue and you don't have to say it out loud because you might have a family member walk by and go, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are you talking to yourself in the mirror? You can do this just in your own mind uh, and say to yourself, is this reality? Is this a dream? Am I dreaming right now? Is this a reality? Is this a dream? And it gets very interesting when you do this and it does trip people out a little bit because you get so in the moment that you're like, this is really weird. Is this reality? What is this? It, it brings everything into the present moment and it can kind of slightly blow people's minds a bit and it can feel a little bit like woo, altered states. But this is just the reality of the present moment. And a lot of us are never very present. You know, we're constantly engaged in some kind of task or we, you know, we're, we have things to do or we, you know, we're online or we're watching TV and that is just busy chatter. So it, it, it creates, um, you know, we're distracted. But when you do a reality check, looking in the mirror and doing this feedback loop, talking to your appearance and really being with and studying your appearance, it brings you into the present moment. And for some of us, it can feel kind of weird because all of a sudden we're really, really present with ourselves. So when you do this several times a day, um, every time you look in a mirror, what you're doing is you you're training your mind to question the nature of reality. And then you're also training your mind to be very uh, observant of details. So you're observing the details of your own eyes, your own face, and becoming very present with that. And you're also training your consciousness as well to turn off the chatter and just get really in the present moment. So this will bring in all of your collective awareness all into one solid moment with yourself. Now, the more you do this every single day, throughout the day, the more chances you have of, of going to sleep and having a dream where you end up in a dream where you're looking at yourself in the mirror. And when you're looking at yourself in the mirror in the dream, you kick into this this script of is this reality is this you know have you really trained yourself with this dream uh, with this mirror work and what you'll end up doing is asking yourself is this reality is this a dream and you'll be really looking at yourself in the mirror and all of a sudden your eyes start growing really big and you start growing a huge afro and you're like wait a minute this is not real like this is something going on here and then you'll realize that you're dreaming and most of us will be so excited like you'll wake up and you'll be like no uh, so that usually happens too when you first start lucid dreaming you get very excited but this is a really great way to to train yourself multiple times during the day now you don't need to do the mirror work if you don't want to because i know some people are like that kind of freaks me out i don't want to look at my face and do this like dialogue with myself 
You can use other things as a form of, um, uh, of uh, as an object of sorts. So you can use your hands. I know that's a very popular one, people just looking at their hands and doing the same um, technique that I was just mentioning to you. Um, and also another thing that is that I like to help guide people with is to use the sky. Use the sky and do uh, a reality check with the sky because the sky is always changing. And so you might have, you know, big clouds and, you know, it could be, um, you know, rays of sunlight coming through the clouds and do the reality check with the sky. Um, also, because a lot of people end up having, you know, this, the sky is, is quite a theme that comes through in dreams as well. So that helps a lot um, because it's already, you're dreaming of skies quite a bit anyway in dreams that when you do a reality check, your chances of seeing a sky in a dream are, are pretty high. So with reality checks, there's ways in which you can get really clever with them, um, you know, choosing different objects to reality check and you can make it a creative and fun process. Um, you'll also find that it makes you more lucid in your living time, in your waking time, because you are stopping the chatter and you're checking in with yourself. You're checking in with quote unquote reality and that's always a good thing to do, right? It's always good to, to, to be able to pull in and have these moments of complete awareness. Uh, you can get also really cl clever with the um, reality checks. Once you start journaling and you have a good solid few months of uh, dream journaling, what you can get, then do is go back through your dreams. And I was talking to you about recurring themes and go through, Go back through your dreams and see what keeps popping up. So perhaps it's like you're always dreaming of uh, water, like the seaside. Or let, let's say you live somewhere where there's a body of water, um, but your dreams seem to always have a body of water. Um, let the body of water be a reality check. So every time, if you live by the seaside, every time you're down by the water, you can look out to the sea and do a reality check and is this reality is this a dream i'm here i'm present in this moment and you might find that your chances of going lucid when you come across a body of water in your dreams pretty high so you can get really clever with your reality checks especially if you've been dream journaling because then you'll be able to see those really important symbols that you have or recurring themes that you have, and you can pull those through in your waking reality and really be present and, and with th that, those visual images uh, by doing your reality checks. So reality checks are a really good one, uh, especially for beginners, to really kickstart your, um, your abilities to go lucid within a dream state. Now, another thing to do, and this is during your waking time, if you do have any kind of practice that keeps you still, and some people, it could be meditation. Other people, it could be prayer. Um, for others, it could simply be um, sitting in the garden, just being in nature. Whatever it is for you that you feel is your stillness and the thing that brings you into stillness, so in your practice, bring that in as well um, through your conscious dreaming practice. So allowing um, the dream state to come through for that. So I'll just give an example. If it's, um, if your stillness is just simply being in nature, so going through a hike through the forest or sitting in your favorite meadow, let this become part of your conscious dreaming practice too. So something that you can do in, uh, I'll just use this as your na the nature time, is really be with nature and, and treat it like it's a dream. So just shift your perception of reality in a fun sort of imaginative way and just allow yourself to, to just imagine like I'm in a dream right now and interact with your environment as though you are in a lucid dream. And so go up to a tree and really look at the tree bark 
uh, pick up some leaves and really look at the leaves or some flowers and really study the petals. So it's a, it's like an, um, almost like you're participating in a waking dream. And it's just through a little shift of your perception to and a bit of playfulness and a little bit of imagination. Now, it's funny that I say this because, you know, when we're little children, this is how we, this is how we operated. Uh, we, uh, we engaged in our reality as though it was play, you know, playtime. And it's interesting because when you look um, at what's actually biologically happening with really young children, especially toddlers and children um, who be, before they go into the school system, they actually, their brainwave function is very different. It's very different than, than, than it is when we are, when we're adults. Um, as adults we, and when we are children in school, we operate um, mostly in the beta brainwave. So biologically, um, these are higher oscillation brainwaves. This, is, this helps us do our menial tasks and, and get things done, our list making and getting from A to B. And this is the brain wave that we really want to slow down. It's the chatter. And it's really what you want to slow down when you are engaging in a mindful practice or uh, meditation or prayer. Um, but little children, they, they don't operate in beta. They, they operate in a slower brain wave, which you see in the dream state. So the theta brain waves, and this is more of a flow state. So this is um, very interesting because if you've ever watched little children, especially toddlers, they're talking to themselves and they're doing do do. They're making little guys say, hi, what are you doing? And hey, yeah, like, you know, they're, they're making their own little world and they're in, in, in they're in, um, within nature, they're playing and they're, they're really engaged. Uh, so there's something to be said about that because it's as though they're in a different Heads, headspace and they literally are because of the brain waves are in more theta and the more flow state more dreamlike state so next time you're out in nature if that's your um go-to for getting still and going within try doing this try being with your environment as if you were in a lucid dream as if you're in the dream state it's amazing what happens with this because it not only primes you for becoming more conscious and aware in an actual dream, but it actually brings you into almost like a more lucid way of living in your waking life. And it can really improve your, um, your connection with yourself and, and it, it can be very quite therapeutic and quite healing. Is it like daydreaming? It's a little bit different from daydreaming because you are really um, reacting to your environment. You're engaging with your environment. So daydreaming is like the realms of imagination. So it's great. It's amazing for problem solving and preparing yourself for things. And it's fantastic. But this is slightly different because you're engaged with your physical reality. So you're going up to the flowers, really looking at them, studying the petals, you're looking at the trees as though, you know, it's the first time you ever saw one. Um, this is the thing, children, they, that's how it is for them. This is the first time I ever saw an ant or they're like, what's this? I, I remember had a, my, one of my nephews picked up some like, um, some rabbit shit. <laughs> he didn't know what it was. He was like, what's this? And I'm like, uh, it's rabbit poo. And he was like, Oh, uh, so, but it's cute, right? The first time they're engaging in something, it's like they're little aliens that have just been, you know, landed here and they're, they're getting to know their environment. So shift up your headspace with this. It's almost like being in a walking dream. I'll, I'll point, I'll, I'll illustrate it this way. So for some of you who've had a lucid dream before, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So you're in a dream you are um, just walking around. All of a sudden you see there's a bright red flower and it's along a path and you're looking at the flower and then all of a sudden you go lucid and aware within the dream state. The first thing you do, and you know this, if you've had a lucid dream, you go over, you're like, oh my God, look at this. It's a flower and it's pink. And look at the dewdrops, and you just are so absolutely enthralled 
with this flower in the dream state and you're, you're feeling the energy and you feel so profound. Okay, now we cut forward to you are awake, you are walking through a park, you're on your way to work, you have a million and one lists in your head, you know you're gonna get in an argument with your boss when you get to work. You're walking through the path, you see a bright colored pink flower along the path, you see it, what do you do? You keep walking. That's what people do. You just, you don't stop. The thing is with lucid dreaming, you would stop, right? You have a dream in a waking moment, you're like, this is amazing. But we never stop. So this is training yourself to stop, to stop and really look and really engage in your environment. It will not only prepare you for lucidity in the dream state, it's just gonna make you a happier person in so many ways. So it's, it's bringing back the practice of, of connection, observing our environment, being with and in the present moment with our environment, and taking in the wonder and the marvel of this amazing world that we have around us all the time. So when you become a conscious dreamer and a lucid dreamer, you end up consciously living and lucidly living. So you will find more and more that you engage with your environment in a more electrified, activated, activated way. Um, so this is just one way in which you can do this. And of course, you don't need to use nature to do it. You can also do it, the walk through a city and do it. Um, on many of my retreats, uh, usually we go out in nature and do that, a walking dream. But um, I've had retreats in cities as well, where I've encouraged uh, everyone goes off for an hour on their own and they interact with wherever they're going. And I said, there's no goal. It's just like how you would in a dream. There's no real goal. You just, there's all these little synchronicities that you say, oh, follow there. Oh, that is, I'm going to walk down that street. And you just allow yourself to experience. Uh, so try that out. That can really be um, actually quite life-changing. And every time that I've, I've done this practice in a group setting where we've all gone off for an hour and done this, and we've come back and reconvened and, and shared our experience in the circle, many people feel like it, it, it was so transformative. Uh, that they that they allowed themselves to experience you know their reality in a way uh, that they never that they never had before. Um, it can feel like deja vu. Uh, do you use lucid dreaming to manifest in three D? Yes. So some people like advanced lucid dreamers um, will use lucid dreaming to bring three bring things in to their lives. Um, so this is another uh, practice, and it depends on what your um, what your lineage is. Uh, some people don't feel so comfortable with doing that sort of thing, but you can definitely bring that in. So you set intentions before you fall asleep. Um, you're able to bring in some of these um, intentions in the dream state, and then you, uh, in the lucid dream, you basically call it in so that you bring that experience into your waking state. So it is something that people do absolutely explore. And there's a lot of stories online you can look up um, that uh, people sharing these experiences that they were able to do that. So nightmares, yes. So nightmares are a really great thing uh, in the lucid dreaming state to almost um, transcend the, uh, the trauma of the nightmare or get to the root cause of the nightmare. So you can use lucid dreaming to um, really help yourself out, especially if you feel prone to nightmares or you have recurring nightmares. Ways in which you can do this, and I'll give you a little tip on how you can do this and how this can help you out and also um, connect you to lucid dreaming. If you have a recurring nightmare, um, First thing to do is write it out. Write it out like a script. So describe everything that happens, the whole scene, and envision it like it's a little film because effectively our dreams are almost like little mini movies. So write it out like it's a little film. 
And then after you've written it out, just sit with yourself in quiet reflection. You can close your eyes and play the film out again in your mind. So you'll, you'll, you'll probably feel some of the emotions. Let's say it's a chase dream with a wolf and a wolf's coming at you and you constantly have this dream and it's recurring and you want it to stop. So this wolf is coming at you. So you, you, you feel all the emotions that you would feel in the dream. And then after doing this little reflection, rewrite the dream in a way that you would want to change a movie. So let's just pretend you're a director and it's like, I don't like the way this movie's going. So I'm gonna change it. So you might change the ending. The ending might change so that the wolf transforms into a butterfly, something that's not harmless or something changes in some kind of positive way. Or it could be funny. You could, you could turn the, the fear into humor as well. So you can shift up the emotion. So it's really important uh, with really feeling into the emotional content of, of your nightmares. And then now, after you re-script your nightmare, your recurring nightmare, you sit down again in quiet reflection. This time, let it your new version, the new little mini version, replay in your mind. And if it's this transformation of the wolf into a butterfly, let that happen. And then feel the new emotion. So the new emotion, perhaps it's um, one of happiness or there's some humor, it's joy. So that's really important, this, this process of, of working with your recurring dreams. Now, if you do this enough times, especially if you're really plagued by nightmares, you can set affirmations to before you go to sleep, the wolf is gonna transform into a butterfly. We got this, we got this. You, so you're, you're preparing yourself or you're rehearsing, and then you might find yourself with that dream cropping up again and the wolf appears and your chances of going lucid could be pretty great. And if you do go lucid, then you're able straight away to help co-create in the dream, transform the, the wolf into a butterfly, or even ask the wolf, uh, why do you keep chasing me? And then you might get some answers and you might find out it has something to do with something that happened to you when you're five years old. You know, so it's interesting how we can, you know, we can store fear and trauma within us. The dreams are there to help us. And I, I'm going to go so far to say that nightmares are our biggest teachers and we can learn the most from our nightmares. So don't be afraid of them. Work with them. Let them, let them be your little teachers and your guides to help you transform and transcend any pain or any fear in your life. Uh, what other questions? Um, how can we use lucid dreaming as a form of healing? I've heard others be able to do this and heal trauma. Yeah, so I just gave a little example of that. So there's things to do, there's work to do in, the, in your wake time. And that was with the rescripting of your dream, sitting with it, feeling the emotional body and the emotions attached, rejigging re the emotions into something that feels a little bit more positive. So there's things that you can do in your waking time to prepare you uh, for the recurring themes and to train your mind to go lucid within the dream state and, uh, and transform. So those are a few ways. Is this connected to a parallel universe? Um, that's a good question. I mean, there's a lot of theories as to what consciousness is um, and some of the more interesting dream states. So like lucid dreaming, the out-of-body experience is, is too, so that can feel like you're in a liminal realm or like an astral realm. There's a lot of theories from, um, what, what do, it depends on where you're at and what, you, what your cosmology is. Um, I'd like to think that we live in a vast, interesting, and uh, highly, um, uh, a, a universe of potential. I love to think that we live in a multiverse in which we have ability to expand and evolve and experience new things. So that's my take on, I'm an explorer though. So explorers probably think that way. Like what's over, what's on the other side of the hill? Let's go, let's go find out. <laughs> I'm not gonna sit around and be bored. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question because that, that, that was just my personal opinion. Um, 
So how do we advance to astral projection? Okay, I'll get, I'll get to that. And I got lucid dreaming this morning. I was going to try calling for a ball of healing energy to stick in my head to heal my sinus infection. Oh, well, that's nice. Uh, yeah, I know some people do create healing energy within a lucid dream state in order to like heal their bodies. Um, the really cool thing, once you start getting the gist of lucid dreaming, is that the physics work a little bit different there. Uh, really try doing your practice in a lucid dream. I know some people, uh, like I'll give an example, if, you, if you're a Reiki healer or you do Reiki, wow, try doing that in a lucid dream. You see the true potential of that energy that you're doing. So if you have a healing practice, wow, it's so mind blowing. When you, when you, when you try it out in the lucid dream state, you're able to see the energy uh, flowing from your hands and you can feel the full potential of, of the healing energy that um, you're facilitating through your practice. Um, also things like yoga, try doing yoga in a lucid dream. Wow, it's so cool. You can see actually the, the, the energy meridians flowing through your body. Um, it's fantastic. So whatever it is that you do, try to do it in a lucid dream. If you're a singer, uh, try singing. It's incredible. Your voice, like I tried it once and I was like, what? My voice doesn't sound that good. <laughs> like <laughs> it was so good in a lucid dream. I had an amazing range. And not only that, I had like these bright glowing colors coming out of my mouth. Each tone had its own correlating color and light. So it was like a form of synesthesia. I could see the true nature of, of music and tone. So definitely, um, uh, try that out, the healing in the lucid dream. Um, okay, is there any techniques to remedy lucid nightmares? For example, being trapped in a lucid dream. I find that after practicing lucid dreaming for an extended period of time, my dreams let, tend to be more stable, but sometimes will morph into a lucid nightmare. I think in a situation like that, it really helps a lot if you have a, um, a mindful practice. So it could be meditation or prayer, whatever your uh, whatever you feel resonates with you. I find in situations like that, when, when it starts to, 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 to change, you're, you're able to pull in your, um, not, not get carried away in the fear, because sometimes the uh, fear energy will, will really amplify big time in a lucid nightmare. So you can call in um, your source energy or, um, or start forming uh, a ball of light within you to um, to be with you within the lucid dream state. Another thing you could do if, if that doesn't resonate is to call in your higher self. So you can say, connect to higher self now. Um, I've done this in a lucid dream and it's, it, it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, so that you just call it, you say, connect to higher self now. What ends up happening is you just get teleported out of the situation and you from my experience and from other uh, practitioners that I talk to, you, you literally teleport through layers of light and connect to like an infinite source of universal oneness and unconditional love. That's another thing you could try um, doing, um, which calls it in. But if these lucid nightmares keep happening, and I'll go back to this belief that I have that nightmares are our biggest teachers, there could be something very important for you to learn from this lucid nightmare. So I would say, write down those lucid nightmares, sit with them in the waking time and really reflect on them. Prepare yourself to come up against them again, because there could be something to learn from that lucid nightmare because beyond the fear, there is incredible scope for learning. We just have to, we just have to get past that scary, zone you know of the the wolves and the little goblins and the whatever it is that they're just it's just material that you can transcend and move beyond so there could be some amazing stuff for you on the other side of that, those lucid nightmares hopefully some of these tips might help you with that um yeah so sometimes people can have uh, aroma come through um, in their dreams or a real, real sound. So lucid dreaming can be amazing 
sensory experiences. And I know being a musician, I've heard music in those realms and I've brought that music back and composed it. And these really amazing um, sensory experiences. And so you can get it with aroma as well, where you really, you know, you, just, you can really smell roses or you can really smell something wonderful, maybe not even so wonderful. It could be a terrible smell too. But these are also experiences within the lucid dream state. Also with lucid dreaming, very um, hyper vivid. Uh, your, your vision is like better than your, your waking vision. It's like you have almost like beyond 2020 vision. It's as though you are able to go right into a substance and see the full uh, detail of everything. Um, that's another experience. The energy held within a lucid dream is very different as well. It feels, um, the energy feels very tangible. Also, the physics work differently. You're able to fly and, and do the, the immense freedom that you have and, and travel and do things that obviously our earthbound energy is not able to do. Those are some examples of what you can, you can experience in the sensory realms of a lucid dream. Um, what other, uh, do you use tools at all uh, to help dream recall? For example, crystals or herbs? Yeah, great question. So I work a lot with Wenerogens, which are plants and herbs that trigger dreams and help with dreaming, help with your memory, help trigger lucid dream states, help trigger precognitive dreams. And they're called Wenerogens because of the word Wenerios. It's Greek and it means to dream and gen is the greek word for uh, creation so they're they're plants that help create dreams um what i'll do is i'll quickly show you a couple um i'll just uh, share my my screen here because some of the the names are a bit big and you you might want to like write them down um but a lot of these herbs if you're interested in them you can find them easily on etsy or ebay um, and so I'll share my screen with you now, and I'll just go over a couple of these uh, Wenerogens with you. And these can be very helpful uh, for also a nice ritual before you go to bed made into a tea, and you're winding down and you're disconnected from social media and from your phone and you're having some quiet time, you're able to have a bit of uh, dream tea before you go to bed. So let's have a, um, I'm gonna share my screen with you. Okay, here we go. Um, let's get up here. We'll start with our first one. You might know this one. Y'all might know this one. It's mugwort. And mugwort is indigenous to a lot of countries. I know it grows in North America. It's called the dream sage by a lot of indigenous people. It's also over here in Europe. It grows wild and it's a great little dream trigger. It's been used for a long time for people to connect with their dream realms. The uh, Latin word here is Ar Artemisia vulgaris and it's named after the um, Greek goddess um, Artemisia, who's like the goddess of uh, woman, womanly patronage. But here's an image here of uh, some fresh mugwort um, and it can be used uh, dried and made into a tea. It can also be smoked. So you can smoke mugwort. There we got some um, mugwort there, it, like a little tobacco uh, tin. So get yourself like a Lord of the Rings pipe and you can start like getting really like wizard dreamer with that pipe there. Also, some people like to, um, oh, I'll just go back. See this little pillow here? You can make some, like a little dream pillow. And some people like to just keep it in the bed with them. And they feel like that's enough to, to help trigger their dreams and help them remember the dreams. So with this, going lucid on mugwort can um, be quite effective for some people, especially when you're setting intentions and you're dream journaling and you're doing your reality checks and your mindful dreaming walks. Um, and also, I don't have an image of it as tea, but you know, you can buy it online like tea and um, make it into a tea. 
it tastes a little bit like chamomile. Um, and it's about like, you know, 20 minutes steeping and it's good to go. Now, also with that herb too, with the uh, mugwort, some people get a lot of precognitive dreams with that as well. So if you are prone to precognition, you might find mugwort um, really triggers them as well. And here's another dreaming herb. This is my favorite one. It's Mexican. It's called Kalea Zacatashishi. And it's a Mexican dream herb. So it also has other names. Um, it's also called uh, dream leaf, leaf of God. It's also called uh, bitter leaf because it's very, very, very bitter made into a tea. Uh, that, that's the Latin word there, uh, Calea terrifolia. And I've, I actually grow, the, grow this at home. I've got quite a few uh, Calea zacatishishi plants. So what you want to do is dry the leaves out. Uh, it's used by the Chantal people in Oaxaca, and uh, it's brewed up as a, as a tea, and it can also be smoked as well. So the Chantal uh, shamans, they drink it as a tea first, and then they smoke it. And this is a, a good one for lucid dreaming, I find. You can find it uh, there, you'll get like bags of it and you make it into the tea. The only thing is with this dream herb is it's really bitter. Um, you can try putting honey or agave in there, but it still makes, it's still really bitter. It's sort of like coated to your tongue, like the bitterness. And um, one thing I find that kind of helps is if you have a little lemon or bite a little bit of lime afterwards. It seems to cleanse your palate, but that's just one thing to be warned with the Kalea Zakatashishi. It's super bitter, um, but it's a really good dream herb for um, activating uh, your more vivid dream states. And it does help a bit with lucid dreaming. And it helps quite a bit on that threshold before you're falling asleep because Kalea Zakatashishi really stimulates your um, hypnagogic state. So the hypnagogic state is the state in which um, when you're on the threshold and you're moving into your, uh, your first stage of sleep, your brain waves have, are slowing down. And there's a lot of interesting phenomena that can happen in the hypnagogic state, including uh, visions of uh, sacred geometry, shapes, lights, and colors. You can have audio um, hallucinations. Uh, some people feel like uh, they get vibrations or sensations in their body. That's the state in which you uh, would have an out-of-body experience. So just to answer that one person's questions about OBEs and the astral projection, uh, that's when you do it is on the verge of the hypnagogic state. Now, Kalea Zakatashishi really activates the hypnagogic state. So if you are interested also in astral projection and out-of-body states, this is a really great herb to really activate that liminal state. So you will find after a cup of Kalea Zakatashishi and you unwind and you go to bed and you're holding your consciousness aware as your body's falling into sleep, you'll, you'll see a lot more imagery, a lot of more Im dream imagery forming. You will, uh, get more hypnagogic experiences, and you might even um, hold consciousness long enough to actually exit your body. So that's a really good one I'd recommend. Um, and I'll quickly go over one more. Um, I won't go over Guayusa, but I'll, I'll hit this one up, which is the blue lotus flower. This is a, a pretty amazing little psychoactive flower. Uh, which means when you consume it, you will feel the effects of it actually in your waking time. Uh, so psychoactive plants, they will alter your state of reality slightly. With the blue lotus flower, your um, altered state of reality will be one of euphoria. Uh, you'll have body um, energy. Uh, it's got very high vibrational energy, this plant. It feels uh, actually quite sublime. In, in many ways. It was used by the ancient Egyptians, and the ancient Egyptians considered the blue lotus flower to be a divine uh, presence, 
And that's why you see a lot of the lotus flower used in a lot of Egyptian iconography. Um, it was considered um, a divine flower and plant consciousness. So this is a really great flower to meditate on uh, for dream vision uh, um, while you're awake and also for, um, for, for exploring lucid dreaming and conscious dreaming. Uh, there's some pictures there of um, some of the Egyptian iconography of the blue lotus flower. This um, comes in the forms of, of flowers and you make it into a tea. So when you make it into a tea, those flowers will reconstitute and become almost like water lily, quite fleshy. When they're in your cup of tea, you, you let it brew for 20 minutes and um, you might feel the effects within, I'd say about half an hour, depending on your sensitivities. Uh, some people are more sensitive than others, obviously. And also with plant work and working with new plants and herbs, obviously you want to approach this that way in a mindful and conscious way as you, with any new substance or any new foods that you're putting in your body, you want to make sure you're not allergic. Um, so I would advise um, doing a, a patch test, um, which you just rub a bit of the herbage on the underarm. Um, to see how that is. But then again, you know, you, you could be allergic internally. So these things are at your own risk, uh, like with anything really. Um, and I think when you're doing plant work, it's also quite good to approach it um, in a mindful, almost, um, you know, honoring the plant, you know, being, uh, you know, uh, seeing the plants as guides uh, and working in alignment with them in some kind of capacity where you're, you're honoring uh, the plant that you're working with. Valerian root works very well too, uh, mostly for, for um, if, you, if you're having anxiety dreams or insomnia, um, valerian root is really good. Also passion flower is an amazing uh, herb for uh, insomnia and also uh, releasing any kind of anxiety as is kava kava, an amazing uh, little root that helps bring in more euphoric states, peaceful states. So if you feel it's difficult for you uh, for, for, for sleeping and uh, anxiety, those are really amazing plants to help you. Um, so let's get some other questions here. Um, someone once had a dream that they were fighting in the trenches of World War I, and then later that day found out my family went to a war museum. Yeah, so this will happen. That's kind of like in the realms of precognition or telepathy. That this happens uh, a lot with family members. Maybe it's because we're all really quite bonded with our family members. Interesting phenomena. Um, and this is when it gets really interesting with the exploration as a conscious dreamer because beyond lucid dreaming is mutual dreaming and shared dreaming. So. I know with a lot of my uh, lucid dreaming friends and peers, we're, you know, we're trying to move beyond lucid dreaming into shared dream states. So this is like connecting with other dreamers in the dream state. Um, and I've got countless examples of that it works. Uh, and mostly when I do retreats, when we set intentions to all connect in dream space, and the next morning we share in our dreaming circle, we're always blown away that we've all had the same dream, not all of us had the same dream, but we've had some very uncanny experiences where a few of us have who experienced exactly the same dream. Um, so there is great potential and great, great scope for interconnectivity within dream states with other dreamers. And it makes a lot of sense um, because we are the collective unconscious and we are, you know, we are all in this soup together. So we can, uh, have the potential of connecting with each other in lucid states as well, which gets really interesting when you have a lucid dream and you're actually talking to your friend in a lucid dream. Um, what other questions do we have? Can you take them every night and how many nights will it take to trigger a lucid dream? Um, so basically with like anything, you don't want to overdo things, but when you're working with a dream plan, it's good to stick with one just to get to know its personality a bit. So if you decide to, to work with Kalea Zacatishishi, the, the Mexican one, um, if you get beyond the horrible taste of it, you can work with it. And I think 
it, it's good to, to try it out every night for maybe a week to see how it goes. I mean, when I first got to know Kalea Zaki Tashishi, I did a whole month, like I did a whole month with the plant every single night. And I did a journal called the Kalea Zaki Tashishi journal. So all my dreams with that plant all had a particular flavor to them. They were all of a very specific um, tone and theme. So it gets interesting. So when you do plant work, uh, do it consciously and do it in a way where you get to know the plant and give it some time. I hope that answers your question when it comes to the plants. Um, someone says something about past life regression. Um, yeah, I mean, this happens uh, quite a bit with people who start doing conscious dreaming and this, we're going into the realms of um, recurring dreams. So especially if you have a recurring dream and you've tried everything and you feel like it doesn't associate to any trauma you had in the past. It certainly isn't linked to anything in your waking life. And you really did the detective work on this. And particularly if you have um, recurring dreams that have a certain theme, for example, I helped a family whose little boy kept having recurring dreams of being in World War II, very specific with the, sh the soldiers in Germany and very specific with a gun tower and floating above a gun tower and grenades and, you know, it's like how, why would a seven-year-old child have, you know, these particularly very intense recurring dreams? So his parents were of the opinion that possibly it was something that he experienced in a past life. So you can, um, you can explore past life healing through the dream state as well. If that's part of your, um, your cosmology and you certainly believe in uh, reincarnation, uh, you, can, you can follow that lineage and certainly um, heal and transcend any trauma from past lives through the lucid dream states and your conscious dreaming states. Um, so does lucid dreaming have an impact on quality of sleep? Okay, this is a good question because some people think, look, I, you know, I have to go to work and I don't wanna be really tired the next day. Absolutely. So a really good thing to know about lucid dreaming um, is to actually understand your sleep cycles a bit and to know um, how much you need per night. So um, sleep, um, sleep schools would say everywhere that seven to nine hours sleep is the optimum amount of time for an adult, seven to nine. So if you're in anywhere in between there, some people can get off with six, but um, I think anything below like five, four, you're, you're really risking your health. Um, we need our restorative sleep. We need a full night's sleep in order to help us biologically. Um, but good point with lucid dreaming. When we're lucid dreaming, it's usually within our REM state. So in our sleep cycle, we will hit up the REM, the REM cycle several times during the night. So we have, um, we have five stages of sleep throughout the night and it, it repeats as we go through the night and our REM cycle seems to get longer and longer. So there's a lot of opportunities to lucid dream in the night. So it won't disrupt your sleep too, too much. Um, most of us will have our lucid dreams just before we wake up. And we are usually in REM just before we wake up. So we're in REM and then we come out into the hypnopompic state that's upon arising and then we wake up. So a really good trick um, to do, and this won't make you too sleepy, is if you allow yourself to wake up a little bit earlier in the morning, just disrupt your sleep, set an alarm, just wake yourself up maybe an hour or an hour and a half or maybe two hours before you would normally wake up. So just let yourself wake up a little bit, not a lot, and you would just hold in your mind, okay, I'm going to go back into sleep and I'm going to um, lucid dream in this next, this next stage of sleep. You could set an intention, maybe it's you're trying to find a mirror in your dream or you want to find your hands or an object in the dream or you have a goal. Set the affirmations for your goal. This is called the wake back to bed technique. So it doesn't have to really disrupt your sleep too much. Um, but it's usually in that last REM cycle that we will get our sleep. So as long as you're getting seven to nine, and you're getting your deep restorative sleep, which is like uh, what you really need, you're gonna be okay, it's gonna be fine. 
Um, but I would have a look at your sleep hygiene because if you do, if you are concerned about you know you know being really knackered and tired the next day, really important for you to just look at what's going on with your sleep hygiene. So sleep hygiene is the habits and rituals that we have in and around bedtime, and this can greatly impact our seven to nine hours sleep. And this could be anything from drinking a cup of tea or coffee before you go to bed, which is gonna keep you really wired and you're probably not gonna go into your deep restorative sleep. Or it could be being on your, your phone last thing before you go to sleep. And now studies show that the blue light emitted from our phones really disrupts um, the melatonin uh, production in our brain. And this overexcites the brain and it can create wreak havoc with our sleep cycles. So uh, things like uh, turning off your phone, getting the electronics out of your bed, <laughs> make the last hour before you go to sleep quite ritualistic. It's like time to quiet, time to go inward, maybe get some dream tea, set some intentions, get onto your journal, start writing some affirmations, get into the mode to go on your exploration into your dreams. Um, so I can't stress enough how you should you know, really switch up your sleep hygiene, make sure that you're, um, you're, you're, you're keeping it all good and you're not gonna get tired from lucid dreaming. So um, it's, you know, you're gonna work in conjunction with understanding your sleep cycles and also cleaning up your sleep hygiene. Also, you know, this, this means your room as well, making your bedroom like an optimum, uh, like, dream machine for you to actually go and do some exploration. If you wanna know more about sleep hygiene, your sleep cycles, and all of these fantastic tips that come along with it, uh, check out my book, because I got a lot of chapters that really cover, like, uh, do this, do, like, guide one, guide two, like, really put out the points um, that help you um, uh, and get creative. It could be a fun process, too, doing all of this. Um, so hopefully that helps answer that question about sleep. Um, oh, Banyan sells mugwort, yay. So that's great. Um, so I dream at the end of my sleep for the most part. Yep, that's with our REM state. Um, so insomnia, um, the, the plant that I was talking about, the blue lotus flower, it's really good for helping insomnia. Valerian root is amazing. Passion flower is really good, and kava kava is also a really great one. Uh, blue lotus flower is a fantastic plant for, for that. Also, if you have insomnia, really look at your sleep hygiene because sometimes there's things that in our environment that, that give us insomnia from drinking a, a cup of caffeine too close to bedtime to our uh, flat screens and our smartphones to stress and worry and anxiety. You might want to bring more meditation into your life. Uh, even glasses of wine is a nut, will really disrupt your sleep cycle. Even though they make you feel drowsy and tired, um, you actually don't really get that deep restorative sleep that you need if you have a glass of wine before bed. So it's, there's a little bit of um, um, a misinformation with that. So uh, be mindful of that. And also other things like cannabis. Cannabis, um, when you stop, it will give you such uh, insomnia. Uh, it, it can be so bad that you just go back to smoking cannabis again. So if you find that you're trying to wean out of a, can a regular cannabis use because cannabis really suppresses dreams, it, it completely shuts down in your REM state. So you will really have a hard time becoming a lucid dreamer if you have a regular cannabis smoking habit. Um, and if you want to stop smoking, so your dreams come back, your REM state comes back. You might want to use blue lotus flower uh, as you're going cold turkey off of cannabis because blue lotus flower will help relieve the uh, insomnia and also pull you into the, the dream states. And it's a wonderful energetic uh, meditation plant as well. Hopefully that answers you, uh, answers your question. Um, can we do problem solving? Absolutely. You can do problem solving in the dream state. It doesn't have to be even a lucid dream. It can just be a regular dream because I think um, when it comes to dreaming, they're all important. If you think of lucidity, it's like, um, like a scale, like a sliding scale. 
So you have absolutely 100% lucid on this end where you're completely aware and engaged. And then you're like totally out like a log on this end. <laughs> and then in the middle, you have varying states of, there. you're there. I mean, you probably know, you have dreams where you're like, oh, I know this is a dream, but I'm just gonna watch. I'm just gonna observe. Or sometimes you have those dreams, you're like, this dream's boring now. I want it to change. I'm gonna wake up. <laughs> so that is in a sense, you're conscious to a certain degree. So in those types of dreams, they get really interesting and they're important. You can observe the dream from a problem solving point of view. So sometimes these style of dreams can be our, uh, really great teachers when we're trying to problem solve things. So um, that can, is big potential too, if you wanna use problem solving in the lucid dream state as well. And I know that there's been countless um, examples of, um, problem solving being worked out in the dream state, not even just in lucid dreams, but just normal, regular dreams, even from the, uh, you know, the invention of the, of the sewing machine, which was like the needle. And uh, the gentleman who, who designed the sewing machine, he was really stumped. He couldn't figure out how to get the needle to, to thread. He knew how to jab it, but he didn't know how to thread it. But he had a dream, a problem solving dream, where he was in a scuffle with um, these dudes in the jungle with spears and their spears had like a hole in them, like a needle. And he woke up and he was like, I got it. <laughs> we, need the, we need a hole in the needle to thread the thread. So that's an example of a, of a problem solving dream. And you absolutely can you know, ask your dream to show you things as you're falling asleep. Um, what other questions do we have here? Um, uh, my website is luciddreamtree.com. Um, that's my website. I'm also on social media. Like I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, and I have a YouTube channel. My YouTube channel is Lucid Dream Tree. I try to do, I try to put out videos every other day or every day. Um, Everything from tips and techniques that you can do uh, for your conscious dreaming practice. And sometimes I, I just share personal stuff like I had a dream, you know, I'll share a personal dream when I'll ask questions and I try to create a little like uh, a little forum, a little community to start chatting about exploration. Um, and am I missing any other questions here? Uh, my first month or two buying, trying to lucid dream. Some nights I would get little sleep over, or, but I got lucid. I'd be energized for the day, but ideally you get lots of sleep and lucid energized. Yeah. Um, if you don't want to ingest herbs, can you keep them as houseplants? Or are there other houseplants we could keep in our home to assist with dream state? Absolutely. Um, uh, you basically, I grow some of these dream herbs. I should probably show you. Okay, I'll be right back because I got huge pots of them and I just keep them around my bed. And basically just be ha having them around and just also bringing more nature into your room is an incredible way. I've noticed that it's an incredible way to pull you into your inner worlds. Now, I do like to look at a bit of science when it comes to stuff like this. And I have researched extensively about plants and our symbiotic relationship with nature. And studies do show that when we are in a forest, we, it brings about calmer states of mind, slower brain waves. There is something about nature that holds us and slows us down and comforts us and zens us out. So there are studies that show that and people forest bathe and there's loads of books on that sort of thing. And so how I bring that into uh, conscious dreaming is the fact that we're so disconnected. And a lot of us live in cities and we, we don't have the, the luxury of living in a forest. So I always think just bring the forest into your home, bring the jungle into your house. So uh, if you check out my book, I list loads of different plants that you can bring into your room that are really um, air purifying plants. They create um, a really lush environment, a healthy environment, uh, purifying the air. And also just having 
the vibration and the energy of plants around you uh, when you're sleeping is it just pulls you into uh, a really relaxed state. So if you feel like you know you're sleeping in a forest. Uh, so one of my things in my book is that I really try to encourage people to really clean up their room and change up the environment, get rid of the stale energy, get rid of the clutter, get rid of that wall of DVDs and the big flat screen TV and just really streamline it down to your bed, which is like your, your dream machine, and then bring in the plant energy and surround yourself, surround your bed with it. Uh, try it out. It really changes up the energy and how you sleep. Um, really does bring in a lot of mindful care. So if you don't want to ingest them, you can have them around you. You can have them around you and it's a wonderful thing to do. Um, and it just looks really nice too. You just go in the room, you're like, wow, it's like a little jungle in here. How cool. Um, so get yourself onto those plants. They're really lovely. Um, and what I'll do is I can just quickly grab a couple for you so you can see the plants that I grow. And because we talked about some of them. So if you don't mind just chatting amongst yourself for like two seconds, I'll go get my plants to show you. Here they are. My children have arrived. So I'll just show you quickly. Um, you know, we were talking about Kalea Zacatashishi, the Mexican dreaming herb and one of my favorite ones to work with. So um, I've got several of these and they're growing. Um, so I'd keep these with me and you can buy the seeds online. You can buy the seeds and you can cultivate them. They, you can grow them indoors. They, they uh, do like a lot of sun, sunlight. So that's really nice to have, especially growing it from a little seed and nurturing it and having it next to your bed. So you don't need to ingest them, you can just have them around. And this one, um, I didn't cover this one in our talk today, um, but I do workshops and webinars on, on specifically on the plants because I work with 15 different plants. And this is another Mexican one and it's called Sinicuichi and uh, also called sun opener plant. So this soon, uh, when it gets a little older, will burst out in some beautiful yellow flowers. And this one was used by the Aztecs for uh, dream journeying and lucid dreaming and uh, dream work. So this one's growing as well. So it's nice to have this sort of thing. If you don't want to ingest them, you can just nurture them like uh, they're your children. And so I like to have them, <laughs> I've got a whole bunch of them. And that's something um, that, that can be really helpful. Um, can I give an example of a plant? Uh, many times I dream of people I don't know. I wake up and remember them in detail. I don't know how to relate to this. Um, yeah, so dreaming of other people can be quite mysterious sometimes. And some of us do have recurring people that appear in the dream state that we don't know in real life. Um, this holds a great mystery to many of us and pretty interesting with the exploration. Um, and I know that, um, you know, there's a lot of theories. Some people feel that possibly there's other timelines going on or we live in a multiverse that's really complex and perhaps these people are out there somewhere um, and we're connected to them in some kind of way. Um, and a lot of people experience that. Um, it's something that's really, um, a really tangible experience. Thank you so much, everyone. I think we're, we finished right in time for um, the end of the webinar. <laughs> ah, we did it. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I feel like I talked too much, but it's like trying to get all the information in there. Um, obviously, there's so much more too. You know, we could talk all night about these sort of things, but please do keep in touch. I would love to um, carry on the dialogue and I, I'm really big advocate of uh, the conscious dreaming community. So I'm really active online, connecting with other dreamers. 
I have weekly uh, meetups called Dream Academy every Sunday. You're more than welcome to join all on my website. Um, oh, thank you very much for your kind words, everyone. Um, I would really love to carry on. So do uh, stay in touch. I think it's wonderful to encourage each other. And with the Dream Academy, we do uh, dream sharing. And that's a really big part <clears throat> of the practice too, is soundboarding our dreams together and exploring together. So I'd love to continue the connection. So thank you so much, y'all. <laughs> mm -hmm.